tennis fan, you know Arthur Ashe and Stan Smith as two of the greatest champions America has ever produced. They won the big ones, Wimbledon, U.S. Open, Davis Cup, and hundreds of major events all over the globe. And not only did they win big, they won with class and style. That's why I'm proud to be part of this program, a program designed to help you play better and have a heck of a lot more fun while you're doing it. Hi, I'm Dick Braden, and welcome to Tennis Our Way. In this program, these two great players will share all they know about the shots and tactics that have made them winners. Together, we'll show you how you can use their tactics to raise the level of your own game to new heights. Hey, you've heard me tell my students what they're going to have to do to become famous by Friday. Well, if I could play like Arthur Ashe and Stan Smith, I'd become famous by Friday. I am really looking forward to this, you guys. And so are we. Welcome. We call this program Tennis Our Way, and for a very good reason. Tennis is an individual game, and it's impossible for us to dictate exactly how you should play it. We are going to tell you what we've learned over the years, some big and little tips for success in tennis. And with Vic's help, we'll show you how to adapt these tips and ideas to your own game. Doesn't matter if you're a beginner, intermediate, or an advanced player, or whether or not you like singles or doubles. Tennis our way could be tennis your way. Remember, everyone is different. Together, we'll show you how to get the most out of yourself and out of this great game. So let's get started. Get ready, Vic. You think we can help him by Friday, Arthur? I don't know, Stan, but let's give it a try. <laughs> Before Arthur and Stan begin their lessons with you, there are three basic points I want to make which will help you get the most out of these two great players. One relates to the physical dimensions of a tennis court. Two relates to the physical laws which govern what happens to a ball. And three relates to the grip you choose which will have a lot to do with your success in this game. Let's start with physical dimensions. The two most important things to recognize about the arena in which we play are the court is a lot smaller than you think, and that net is a lot higher than you think. That net is only three feet at the center. But guess what? Nearly half of the errors in this game go into this net. So you've got to hit that ball pretty high. How about the court? Is it really wide? Looks wide from this singles line to the other singles line. 27 feet wide. Seems like you'd never miss the shot. But guess what 27 feet is in degrees? 19.1 degrees. That's all. You hit a shot down the line, you hit a shot cross court. That's all the variation there is. That's why it's easy to make an error in this game. How about length? 78 feet long seems like a whole football field. But you knock it long over and over again. It's easy to hit a ball 80, 85 feet in this game. So it's tough to keep the ball in this court. How about the serve? You have to start off, you get two tries to get it in a dinky little box. How big is the box? 21 feet long, 13 and a half feet wide. Again, it's hard to get it in, even in two tries. Even some of the best players in the world miss. Now you're trying to hit the ball with depth. Why do you want to keep the ball way back here? Because the further back you can keep your opponent, then they can hurt you. You let them get to the net, they can hit 120, 130 degrees. Keep them back here, 19.1. So you try to keep it deep. So in our court, we put the dotted line. We hope that intermediates can hit it back to here. That'll keep their opponent pretty deep. But with the pros, we try to keep them within five feet of the baseline. And if you can do that, great. Now what about sharp angles? Well, we've shown you some angles using paint colors. In this little box right here, that's one of the toughest shots in the world to make. So we tell most people, forget these zones. Nobody can hit it in there. That's just too sharp an angle. People say, yeah, but what happens if I do run up against somebody who can hit it in those little zones? The answer is, don't worry, that person's probably not living. Let's take a look at some of the physical laws which govern what happens to a ball. 
Arthur and Stan will demonstrate the three basic physical factors which have to be honored by every tennis player when striking the ball. Think about it. You have to know which angle to go up or which angle to go down, how the racket face will meet the ball, straight up, slanted, and the speed at which you swing up or the speed at which you swing down. Those three factors have to be honored. Now, when you first start off, it's kind of mechanical. You have to think about it a little bit, and you have to experiment. But as you get better and better, that's automatic. And by the way, if you are really considerate of these three factors and you understand them, it also helps you on the other side of the net. It helps you anticipate your opponent's shot so you can get there a lot faster. You have more time to swing freely. We've talked about the physical dimensions of the court. We've talked about the physical laws which govern what happens to the ball. Finally, we must talk about the grips. This may look a little strange, but to help you understand the grips, I've put green tape on each bevel of the racket grip, and I've put an X on my palm. Now use the X on each bevel, and you'll get the appropriate name. Let's go this way. At the very top of the grip, if I put the X on that very bevel, I now have the Eastern Bakan grip, very popular grip. Now let's go to the next bevel. On this one, number two, if I place the X on the second bevel, I now have the continental grip. And many people use this as a one grip game. One grip for the forehand and backhand. Now let's go over to the third grip. On that bevel, it's the same as the plane of the racket face. I place the X against bevel number three. I have what's called the eastern forehand grip. I go all the way over to number four. I'm coming closer to the bottom of the racket. I place the X on bevel number four. I now have a semi-western forehand grip. I can go all the way to the bottom. Number five, put the X against number five. That's a full western forehand. With these fundamental tennis concepts in mind, let's start inning with Stan and Arthur. Good luck. Everybody avoided Stan Smith's forehand if at all possible. It was one of those shots that should have been registered with the FBI as a deadly weapon. When Stan hit a forehand, you could feel the pace on the ball with your racket straight. But he could smoothly slice it down the line for an approach shot too. He built his game around the big forehand and it won him a lot of matches. The forehand is the first stroke that most of us learn, simply because it's more natural to swing the racket from the dominant side. But a lot can go wrong if you don't learn it right. Let me show you how I hit my forehand. I use the eastern forehand grip for my forehand. This puts my hand in a very strong position right behind the racket. This is the same position my hand would be in if I was just hitting the ball without the racket. the racket back the moment I see the ball is coming to the forehand side. I try to watch the ball come off the opponent's racket strings in order to pick up its flight as soon as possible. By the time the ball crosses the net, I'm well into my backswing. By the time the ball bounces on my side of the net, the backswing is complete with a racket head pointing at the back fence. Some players droop their racket head on the backswing, but I feel this encourages too much wrist action. I do not, however, hold a lock wrist during the stroke. I used to do this, but my college coach encouraged me to relax my grip a bit to add more fluidity to the shot. And now, I feel I can have more confidence and feel and power as I hit the ball. My free hand extends toward the oncoming ball. This helps me stay in balance and get sideways in a good hitting position. My weight shifts to the back foot as my racket goes back. If you're ever in doubt about where your weight should be, the weight should be where your racket is. I step towards the ball so my weight transfers into the shot. That will give you that heavy ball that will knock the racket out of your opponent's hand. But don't plant that front foot too soon or you'll be forced to swing off balance. 
Remember to keep that back foot on the ground throughout the swing. I make contact with the ball in front of my front foot with my arm fully extended in the handshaking position. I like to hit all my forehands at about waist level. That's my strike zone. So when the ball is low, I bend my knees to bring my strike zone down. That way I can always execute that basic stroke and the ball won't go into the net. As I hit the ball, the racket is traveling on a low to high path. This will give the shot just the right amount of that good top spin. Many players make the mistake of starting with their elbow out and they swing outside in with their arm and racket going across their body. I think of the forehand as an inside out swing. The elbow starts at the rib cage and it extends out as the arm and racket go towards the target. On the forehand follow through, 90% of my weight ends up in my front foot. The hitting arm is straight, the racket nice and high, above shoulder level and extended towards the back fence. I make sure that I keep my racket on that target line for as long as possible. That way, if I'm a little bit late, or a little bit early, I'll still hit the ball towards the intended target. Some players develop faulty strokes by rushing through their finish. I make sure I complete my follow through before preparing for the next shot. Then I use good footwork to get in position to continue the point. So that's the basic forehand, but my partner was hitting the ball right to me. In a match situation, he won't do that, and neither will yours. So let's look at the job of hitting the forehand in a match situation. When there isn't time to step into the shot, the forehand can be hit with an open stance. Power comes from the natural strength of the forehand and the coiling action of the upper body. The stroke itself is the same, but the footwork differs. Those low balls. A lot of players attack those low balls by dropping the racket head and bending over at the waist. Now, if you do this, there's no way you can be consistent. The proper way to handle this shot is to bend at the knees and keep your upper body more or less upright. If you do this, you'll be a lot more consistent on those tough low balls. The key to handling that high bouncing ball on the forehand side is to start with a high backswing and the swing level all the way through the shot. The high bouncer may look easy, but it must be played carefully. I concentrate on making a full, smooth stroke and extending the racket well out along the intended line of flight. If you're at or behind the baseline for this shot, make sure to clear the net by 8 or 10 feet. Otherwise, you'll give your opponent a short ball to attack. Above all, don't overswing on the slow high bouncers. Get it back deep with your good forehand stroke. On balls hit directly to you or slightly to your backhand side, it's possible to literally run around the shot and take it on your forehand. If you have a weak backhand, it may be very desirable to do that. You have to be decisive and quick on your feet to do it right. There's nothing different in the technique of the stroke itself. Just remember, the runaround forehand puts you out of position in the court, so you must execute it well, or your opponent will have an open corner to attack. With the extreme topspin forehand, you want to make sure that the back of your backswing is very low, you can brush the ball in almost a vertical fashion, and finish extremely high. This low to high motion should lift the ball over the net by a good seven feet. It can be risky if it's hit too short because opponents can come in and attack it. Executed properly, the heavy topspin forehand can produce great passing shots. And it can be used to pin an opponent to the baseline all day long.
The difference between hitting cross court and down the line is a matter of positioning. To hit down the line, I try to set my body parallel to the target line. To hit cross court, my feet and shoulders are more open. I don't believe in trying to disguise a shot by hitting it early or late from the same position. If you position your body correctly, you'll hit the shot so well, it will put pressure on your opponent whether or not he knows which way it's going. The drop shot is not a very high percentage shot, but if you're in perfect position and you hit it well, it can be gratifying and rewarding. The perfect time to hit the drop shot is when you're in good position to hit the approach shot, slicing it down the line. But instead, you surprise your opponent by putting a little more slice in the ball and dropping it over the net. Remember, the forehand you practice is the same forehand you play with. Your basic strokes shouldn't change, but footwork, Length of stroke and body position must change in different situations to deliver the racket to the ball where and when you want it. If you're having trouble on your forehand, it may be that your swing is too long. For most people, that seems to be the syndrome. You only need that racket to stay in front of your body. You don't need to let it go behind your body in this manner. Well, how do you make the correction? Go against the fence. Put your back up against the fence. Now practice swinging, keeping the racket on the front side of your body. You don't want this, and you don't want this. You want this. Let's take a close look at Stan Smith's smooth forehand. Look at the loop. He starts high, he lets the racket fall low. That helps give him a lot of power, at the impact point, his racket is vertical, and then he goes out straight towards the intended target. Now look at his follow through. We're gonna take a closer look at that because right after this, he breaks the elbow. And I wanna tell you what that's all about. Nice follow through straight out. Now he lets the elbow break right here, and that takes the pressure off of that arm. But sometimes it happens fast and people try to go straight there. They don't see the racket go out towards the intended target. That's good looking. Watch from the top angle. You'll see how Stan steps out into the ball and hits the ball even with his front foot. That's what we mean when we say hit the ball off the front foot. Watch how far the racket goes out towards the intended target before he cuts across his body. Now I want you to see this great angle one more time, but pay special attention to the left arm. Watch his left arm. It does not go to the side fence. It'll cut back in towards his body. The function of that left arm helps stop the shoulder that makes the racket snap faster through the ball. Now from behind, watch how high the ball clears the net for a nice deep shot. <clears throat> you know, when you're out there practicing, you have to practice all the strokes. Very often people say, well, I don't have to practice my forehand. My forehand is great. But the fact is, if you don't go out and practice your strong side, you may lose it. And that's our basic forehand lesson. Make your forehand strong and it will put lots of pressure on your opponents. And I hope it wins as many points for you as it has for me. Arthur's backhand is one of the most fluid shots I've ever seen. Over the years, I've always enjoyed watching him hit this shot, unless I happen to be on the other side of the net. He can do almost anything with it. Chip it, slice it, hit it with topspin, or crack it flat down the line. In fact, he even has a pretty classy drop shot. On top of everything else, you never know exactly which shot Arthur's going to hit until the damage has been done. When most of you started to play, the backhand was probably the second shot that you learned. And the same was true for me when I began to play at age seven. I immediately was made aware that the backhand grip itself was weaker than that for the forehand, and I had to make some compensations. 
Number one, I learned how to literally sling my racket at the ball to generate terrific racket head speed. Secondly, I had to make contact with the ball out in front, somewhere opposite my right foot. And thirdly, I had to hit the ball higher over the net than I would for a forehand, How about a foot higher. So let's go back now and take a look at some of those backhand fundamentals. This is my backhand grip. The backhand grip is considered weak because all that is behind it when you make contact with the ball on the other side is the thumb and the tips of the fingers. To compensate for this, you need to develop good timing and a fluid smooth stroke that keeps the ball in the strings as long as possible. My ready position on the backhand is just about the same as that for the forehand. I bounce lightly on the balls of my feet, with my feet about shoulder width apart, my torso leans slightly forward, racket is held loosely in my hand, points toward the center of the net, and is parallel to the ground. From that starting position, I can move to hit almost any kind of backhand. No matter how far I have to go to get to the ball, I try to move my racket head first. And when I get within hitting range, I use my free hand to help guide the racket into the backswing past my rib cage. I'm ready for the backhand stroke itself. I try to finish the end of my backswing by the time the ball bounces on my side of the net. That way I know I will not be late. Also, I pivot on the ball of my left foot, step forward at a 45 degree angle with my right foot, and make contact with the ball here, not here. I try to hit the ball with a very distinct lifting action on the backhand side. My arm is as fully extended as is naturally possible at impact. This gives me maximum leverage, and when I combine this with meeting the ball out in front, maximum power as well. Through impact, I am trying to transfer my body weight from my back foot to my front foot. If I didn't execute this weight transfer, I would not only lose power, but I would feel off balance and wind up hitting the ball farther back in my stance than is desirable. My racket face is slightly open and remains open throughout the follow through. This helps me to keep the ball in the strings a very long time. The follow through itself is that portion of the swing from the time the ball leaves the strings to the end. At the end of my follow through, my racket face points toward the sky. That's an indication I've made a full and complete backhand stroke. One of the advantages of a good backhand is its great versatility. From essentially the same windup, you can hit the ball in a variety of ways. Here's how. Flat backhands are used when you want to generate as much power as you can comfortably handle. And that will happen because the ball is going to go in a straighter line with this shot than with any other backhand. It should only be used when the ball is going to bounce around your waist. If it's any lower around your knees or any higher around your shoulders, then you're at greater risk to make a mistake. It's used chiefly for passing shots, but remember that risk is attached. And this shot keeps the ball very low. The slice backhand is the bread and butter shot on this side. It is to be hit safe and deep with less power than the flat backhand. And the key point here is consistency. The shot itself has natural loft because the racket travels under the ball and is oftentimes used as a lob. 
Then again, it also saves energy because it doesn't take very much from you. And it has natural disguise and can be hit from any height over the ground. It is the most versatile of all the backhand shots. The floater is just a high hanging slice used more frequently on slower courts, especially clay, at times when the flat or topspin backhand is not called for. The ball itself is hit with very little pace, and the follow through is lower and sharper than that for a regular slice, and it saves energy. Strategically, it is chiefly used as a cat and mouse device to find an opening for a harder shot. The topspin is a forcing shot and is by far the riskiest of the backhands because the racket head brushes up the side of the ball and finishes upside down. Contact with the ball must be made at waist level or lower and though it can be hit at various heights over the net, most players want their topspin backhands to land halfway between the service line and the baseline. This shot clearly requires a lot of practice. The approach shot is used to come to the net. Conceptually, most players attempt the approach shot backwards with a long backswing and a short follow through. It should be the other way around. Short backswing, normal follow through. Though some players stop to hit this shot, I prefer to move right through it, making sure my backswing is complete by the time I get to the ball. Use underspin to give you time to get to the net. The short cross-court topspin is used to open up the court as quickly as possible or to pass an opponent who is out of position. It is to be hit as low as possible over the net and most of the time with topspin. Though the net is higher at the sides, this can also be hit down the line. A drop shot is used to deliberately bring your opponent to the net and nearly always hit with underspin. Using the same backswing as a normal slice backhand, the racket head is brought sharply downward, as for a floater. In fact, a drop shot is a floater that just clears the net. Drop shots should not normally be tried from behind the baseline and are most effective when well disguised. You know, Arthur's some kind of a guy, isn't he? You watch him, he speaks softly, you sit down, talk to him at a table. Very intelligent guy, very quiet. Then you go out and play him, and he beats your brains out. Let's talk as teacher and student. What is Arthur saying when he talks about feeling as though you're slinging the racket out on the backhand side? Well, when you coil your body for the backhand, and when you're uncoiling, and if you'll stop your body abruptly, it'll make the arm snap out. It'll make the arm snap faster than human muscle can contract. It's a whipping action, and it feels as though you're slinging the racket, and that comes from stopping the body suddenly and then throwing the arm out there. Now, why does Arthur talk about getting the racket further out in front on the backhand side? You've got to be early. He is so right. The reason is the shoulder housing the hitting arm on the backhand side is on the front. So when you stop your body, now for the slinging action, you've got to give it a little room. You're hitting a ball out here. But look what happens on the forehand side. This shoulder now becomes the back shoulder. Now you can be much later on the forehand side and still hit the forehand quite well. You want to get out in front on the forehand too, but you can recover on the forehand a little bit later on the shot because the shoulder housing the hitting arm is on the back. So remember, when you're hitting the backhand, the shoulder's on the front, get it way out there. You know, I find two major problems on the backhand. One, people don't seem to be able to get the racket lower than the intended point of impact on the drive. You've got to get that free hand that Arthur talks about to do the right thing. The free hand is your second hand. Put it at the throat and practice coming down to the thigh. Take the racket out of your hand and let the hand come down to the thigh. Just practice this motion. 
over and over again. Then hook the racket, bring it down there, and you've got it. You just have to pay your dues. Second point, people don't seem to be able to get the racket hit vertical at the impact point. It's not a natural feeling on the drive. So they'll come up, hit the drive, the racket's turned under, the ball goes sailing, they go out the gate and look for the ball. So we'll tell people, hey, you need some feeling here. Close your eyes, stop when you're going to meet the ball, and tell us if you think the racket's right. And they'll say, yep, right there, that's right. But look at that bevel. That ball is going out of the state. Now we say, keep your eyes closed and let us play with your racket. So their eyes are closed, we'll take the racket and put it straight up and down. And we'll say, how does that feel? And they go, that feels crummy. And we say, remember that crummy feeling, it's going to make you famous. Arthur can do anything with his backhand. Look at the racket face up. Looks like he's going to slice, but watch carefully. The racket right here drops, and the racket face will be vertical at the impact, not under the ball. Way out in front of his body, then out towards the intended target. Now, he comes across his body, but you get tricked. You don't see him go out towards the intended target because it's so fast. But if you watch very carefully as we play it again, you will see that he gets the racket lower than the ball, way out in front, and goes way out to the target there. Then he rolls across his body. That's great. From the top, you're going to see one of Arthur Ashe's secrets. Watch, it looks like he's going to slice the backhand. But watch very carefully as the racket drops, you'll see it turn in the opposite direction. Watch the head now, it's turning, it's going down, knuckles down. Now instead of a slice, watch, at the impact point, the racket's absolutely vertical. It turns into a drive, not a slice. Here's a backhand practice tip for you. Use the court fence as a practice laboratory. All you got to do is put balls in the fence. Put it at the angle you choose to swing. Then all you have to do is go out and swing at that particular angle. That bright yellow out there is really going to make it easy for you to make an upward swing. You can also use those tennis balls to check out the racket head position. If you stop at one of those balls, the racket head's tilted, you're not right. So just practice going up, change it this way. Now come back, make another swing. You'll get it right if you use the court fence properly. Think about it this way. The court fence is usually stopping your wild shots, but you could actually use the court fence to stop you from making wild shots. That's my lesson on the backhand. Remember, most players don't have good backhands at all, and the ones that do are feared the way gunfighters used to be feared in the Old West. I really mean it. So work on your backhand, and you'll win lots of duels out on the tennis court. When Stan's serve was really on, there wasn't much you could do against it. On grass or cement, it was formidable. It was fast and it was heavy. The ball carried a lot of pace, making it even harder to handle. Stan's imposing size didn't hurt him either. When he stood up there to serve, some players would lose to him psychologically before he served the first ball. The serve is the only time you have complete control of when and where you're going to hit the ball. Your opponent is at your mercy. So take advantage of that. It's true that the serve is one of the most difficult strokes to hit, but don't let that intimidate you. Now let's look at some of the fundamentals of this stroke. The foundation for every good stroke is the grip. And that's of course true with the serve as well. When I was a kid, I first started playing the game about 10 years old, I used the eastern forehand grip for my serve. Within two years, I moved the grip over to the eastern backhand grip. This allowed me to get more spin on the serve as I took that nice full swing through the ball. Now some players grip the racket too tightly. You can see their forearms flex there and their upper arms. When they do that, they'll tend to muscle the ball over the net and they really don't get too much power. It looks like this. <clears throat> now, if you can hold the racket nice and loosely, you'll see that your forearm is loose, your upper arm is loose, and you'll be able to get that whippy motion through the serve and get much more power, like this.
prepare for my serve, I start with my front foot at a 45 degree angle to the baseline. The back foot is in line with the front foot, so if you do a line between the toes towards your target, you'd be lining up right at that corner. Okay, now I'd have my front foot here two inches behind the baseline, so I make sure I don't foot fault. And then my pre-swing routine should be the same every time, just like a basketball player shooting a free throw. I bounce the ball a couple times, keep my knees nice and flexed, make sure my grip is loose, and I think about that target in my mind. I don't have any problems with my physical routine because I've done it the same way every time. All I'm thinking about is my strategy. Some people think the toss is the least important part of the serve. I think it may be the most important part of the serve. Have you ever tossed the ball like this? <laughs> I'm sure we all have at one time or other. But there are three things wrong with that toss. First, there's hinging at the elbow, hinging at the wrist, and there's too much spin on the ball. Now the correct way to hold the ball for the toss is to hold it like you're holding an ice cream cone. With your hand in the sideways position, there'll be no hinging at the wrist or elbow, but the lever will be from the shoulder. In this position, you can place the ball up so your contact point will be with your arm and your racket fully extended in front of the front foot. I toss the ball far enough into the court in front of me so that I can lean into the serve and get power behind my serve. If I were to let the ball bounce in the court instead of hitting it, it would bounce about a yard in front of the baseline. I try to throw the ball in the same place for every serve, but if I don't, I catch it and start again. I never go after a bad ball toss. With a consistent toss, you'll find you can dictate where the ball will go instead of the toss dictating where you hit it. You'll find there will be a direct correlation between the consistency of your toss and consistency of your serve. I start my service swing with both arms forward. From there, as I toss with my left arm, I bring my right arm back into what I call the hurrah position, for obvious reasons. From there, I go into the back scratching or the trophy position, just like those little guys on top of all your trophies at home. At that point, I go up and forward and follow through towards my target. I start with my weight forward as I'm bouncing the ball. Then I shift it back and then forward as I go up to hit the ball. Some players start with their weight back and go straight forward, but this rocking motion helps me with my transfer and rhythm of my serve. After the toss, I like to keep my left arm up because it helps me with the position of my body and it keeps me from turning into the serve too soon. I like to have a good knee bend because it gives me acceleration into the serve and gets me moving towards the net. A good shoulder turn helps me to rotate into the shot and gives me that added power when I need it. To help with the consistency on my serve, I like to keep my head up all the way through the serve, just like the golfer keeps his head down all the way through the stroke. Whether you serve in volley or serve and stay back, a good follow through across your body towards your target is vital. I prefer to serve in volley. It's won a lot of big matches for me. Great serves are not necessarily fast serves. Consistency, control, and variety, these points are as important to you as speed. So work on control and consistency, and getting the most of those first serves in, and don't worry about aces. As for variety, let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. I hit the big flat serve when I really want to go for power. This serve has less margin for error because it has less spin and it crosses the net by only 6 to 12 inches. This serve is effective on all surfaces, but it really is effective on fast surfaces like grass or cement because it really takes off. It will often force a weak return, which I can put away with a good volley. You need to practice the big flat serve so you can have confidence to use it in a match. But once you do, it can be quite an intimidating factor. Sometimes you will try to muscle that flat serve too much and you'll lose your timing. So as in golf, the harder you want to hit the ball, the more relaxed you should be. I feel when my flat serve is working effectively, I'm pretty tough to beat.
the sly service hit with the racket in this position as the racket is coming across the ball in a part side spin on the ball and causes the ball to curve in flight. The slice serve is an effective attacking serve. Just as a baseball pitcher mixes up his pitches, a good server will mix up his serves. The side spin on a slice serve keeps the ball low when it bounces. It can draw the opponent wide on the deuce court. It can be used to jam the opponent by serving into his body. The toss for the slice can be a little bit more to the side, but be sure you don't throw it too far to the side or you will telegraph the serve to your opponent. The slice serve will not be hit as hard as a flat serve, but it can be just as effective for you. The twist serve, which I don't recommend for beginners, is hit with the racket head coming from an extreme angle, coming from below the ball, across the ball, imparting side spin and top spin, so the ball hits and bounces away from your opponent when it hits his court. The twist serve is sometimes called a kick serve. It requires a tremendous amount of arch of the back. Very few players use it, and if they do use it, they use it sparingly. When I do use it, I use it as a changeup. It keeps my opponent off balance if he's returning well, and it's a good serve if he doesn't like to hit the high bouncing ball. The twist serve also gives me more time to get to the net, and unless my opponent moves in on the return, he'll probably hit a nice high one that I can knock off for a winner. This serve may win you some points, but I would not recommend that you build your whole game around it. My second serve is somewhere between the slice serve in which the racket's like this, and the twist serve, where the racket's like this. It still imparts side spin and top spin on the ball, which enables me to swing as hard on my second serve as I do on my first serve, but with more margin for error. I'm sure you've heard it said that your serve is only as good as your second serve. Why is that? Well, anybody can hit the ball hard, but you must be able to depend on your second serve, especially in those crucial situations. To get the second serve in consistently, you must practice it. Now the dilemma that you have is that the second serve must go in the court or you lose the point. But if you hit it too easily, then your opponent's going to take advantage of you. Speed is important, but depth is even more important on the second serve. I try to keep the ball within a yard of the service line so my opponent won't be able to step in and take advantage of it. To do that, I make sure that I keep my arm up, my head up, and I hit up at the ball. The racket head speed is the same on the second serve as it is on the first serve. But on the second serve, I'm hitting up at the ball, imparting side spin and top spin, which gives me more consistency and depth with my serve. If you have confidence to get your second serve in all the time, you'll be surprised how much better you hit your first serve. You know what I always liked about Stan? Big match, critical point, he walks to the line, got that very confident look on his face. You know why? Because he knows he's going to kill that dude when it's his turn to serve. Why does he know that? Because he paid his dues. He went out there and practiced, practiced, practiced until his swing was fluid, smooth motion. That's the name of the game, pay your dues. Have you noticed that people seem to have a lot of trouble on the toss? You know they're out there praying. They're going, oh, be right on this one. Well, the toss is not that hard. All you got to remember is the height of the toss depends upon what you do with this hand. If this hand leads and is way ahead of the racket, then you'll have to throw the ball a little higher. If these two hands go together, now you'll only have to throw the ball about 20 inches out of your outstretched hand. That means about the peak of your reach. So think about it, go out there and practice and notice what you do with the throwing hand. Now, think about this. If you throw the ball low, the ball will sit in the hitting zone of the racket about 10 times longer, minimum 10 times longer. Because when you throw a ball high, it's dropping through the hitting zone at the rate of gravity. If you throw the ball low, it's in the hitting zone, it's starting to slow up, and now it starts to fall down up to 10 times longer, minimum. All right, the next point I see is that on the backswing, people have a tendency from beginning days to turn the palm up, get the racket ready to hit. The problem with that is when the palm is up, you eliminate the all-important loop behind your back. 
That palm has to be down. If it's down, you can make the loop. If it's up, you eliminate the loop. Always try to practice this little motion. It'll really hold you in great stead. And the last point I want to make on the serve is what really happens to the wrist? People think it's this kind of a wrist snap. But what really happens is when you're bringing the racket up, this wrist will bend just a little bit, and you'll see the hand moving. But when the racket gets up in the zone, this hand actually stays straight. You will see knuckles on this side, and you'll see the palm make this motion. It's critical that you learn this motion. You can do it by just putting your hand up and practice that motion. You can always spot people who think it's this, because if you look at their legs, they have big hash marks on them. Watch two specific points from this side view. The first one, his front foot, the left foot, is positioned against the court. That will actually help the forearm snap faster. Don't jump off the ground and try to hit the serve hard. Now watch at the impact point. He's going up at the ball. He will not hit it down. He will be hitting it forward. The racket is absolutely vertical at the impact point, so you don't hit down. After this, the forearm makes a very strange movement. Not a wrist snap forward, a forearm twist. We'll show you that from the top view. We're going to show you Stan Smith's serve frame by frame. You're going to see it from a view that very few people have ever seen. Going slowly like this, you will see some things that you may not have thought possible. Watch carefully as he turns his body and starts bringing the racket back. You will see that the racket face is down. That means the hitting hand palm is down. But look at the left hand. Is it way out in front of the body? No, it's to the side and towards the net. Racket face down. Why? Because that will allow you to make the loop behind your back. Many people have the racket face up here, and that's why they can't make the loop behind their back. The racket now goes behind, but his body is already starting to turn, which creates a force which will not allow the racket to scratch against his back. Notice it's going a little bit away from his body. Turning in. Now watch carefully because you're going to get a knife look right here. This is the look that people just don't see. See it? It looks like he's going to slice the ball in half. Now he has to turn the forearm out. We call it pronating the forearm. He gets it out, but by getting it out and turning it that way, he can't stop it. So watch the way the racket will go in the opposite direction. It's not a wrist snap forward, it's a forearm twisting. Where's his left arm? We're going to show you that from another view. You know, the left arm is really a secret arm on the serve. So many people do not see the secret, though. They see the left hand like this, way down the left side of the body. But the left arm has a very specific function. Before the impact point, watch the left arm of Stan Smith come against the chest. Right there, when he stops, it helps stop the right shoulder and forces the forearm to whip. That makes the racket head go through the ball very fast. Left arm against the chest, then there. If you want more power on a serve, here's a practice tip for you. Remember, the goal is to make this forearm snap faster. Now, you saw Stan do this when he went up to serve. The left hand, the throwing hand, came against the front of his body. The function, to stop the shoulder, make the forearm snap more. But you'll see people put all the emphasis in unbelievable body movements like this, and this, and this. All you have to do is stand flat-footed to run the test, turn your body, stop the shoulder, and watch it snap. Just go spaghetti, here you go. Boom! Boom! That's all you need. Nice 100 mile an hour serve. The rules of tennis require that you must serve every other game. You can't avoid it, so don't hide from it. If you can improve your serve, the rest of your game will improve as well. So practice that serve. And when you finally ace that favorite opponent of yours, think of us and smile. Arthur has always had a very aggressive volleying style. He goes for broke even on low balls below the height of the net. He's not afraid to take risks. And his technique is so good, he can get away with it. When you play him, you have very little control of the point because his shot is either an outright winner or he just missed. Unfortunately for his opponents, usually it's a winner. 
Some people confuse the terms volley and rally. A rally is when a ball goes back and forth across the net. A volley is actually a ball hit before the ball hits the ground, a mini forehand or a mini backhand. The term actually derives from military jargon, meaning shot from a cannon. And that's exactly what I hope your volley will be like right after this lesson. There are two essential differences between the preparation for the volley and the preparation for a ground stroke. During the preparation for a ground stroke, the racket itself is roughly parallel to the ground, but at the net, it's tilted slightly upward so that the top of the racket is just below eye level. This helps you to improve your hand-eye coordination and offers a much stronger support system when you make contact with the ball. And secondly, as you move forward to make contact with the volley, turn your wrist out for the forehand and back towards you for the backhand so that the racket itself will be in front of you when you make contact. When I was seven years old and first began taking lessons, I was taught to use one grip for the forehand volley and another grip for the backhand volley. But as I got older and wiser and more experienced and my touch got better, I found out I can use just one grip for both, and that's the continental grip. I just change wrist positions to get the shots that I need. I turn it out for the forehand volley and back toward me for the backhand volley. Many players have a backswing that is much too long on the volley, and this can interfere with their timing and their ability to hit the ball out in front. In addition, a long backswing can cause wristiness, whereby the racket head flips through the ball rather than coming through it smoothly and firmly. So, for both the forehand and backhand volley, move the racket head up in front with the face wide open. When volleying in a match situation, most players feel their tension levels rise perceptibly, and that is because the ball is traveling roughly 60% faster as it crosses the net than it is when it gets back to the baseline, and players realize they must move their feet in order to properly execute a volley. The best way to do that is to cross the left foot across and in front if you have to move to your right, and if you have to move to your left, cross your right foot across and in front, and that is true whether you're left-handed or right-handed. Why do players move their feet in this manner when they're volleying? Well, if you have to move to your right and you move your right foot first, you'll catch your center of gravity between your left and your right foot, and you'll have no forward momentum if you have to go farther. The same is true in the left. If you move your left foot first, you'll catch your center of gravity in the middle, and you'll not be able to move forward to get a wider shot. If you mistakenly move your right foot first when you're moving right for a volley, this foot will actually act as a brake to your forward momentum because your center of gravity will now be between your left foot and your right foot. Plus, you'll feel off balance for the volley. So for good results, cross your leg over and into the ball. A lot of club players let the ball play them when they're at the net. And that's especially true on the forehand because the racket sometimes comes back as far as the shoulder, right here. What I do to remedy that is to make sure when I'm volleying that the racket head is tilted upward and in front of me at all times. As soon as I have hit my last volley, my thoughts immediately return to where my recovery position should be, and that is not necessarily the middle of the court. This recovery position should be toward that side of the court where my last volley was placed. Notice we've been volleying in the area of the net, but how'd we get there? As a right-handed server, my thoughts when I get up to the baseline are to make sure that my toss is placed well into the court so that I will come across with my right foot and finish well inside the baseline, push off on the right foot, and get at least as far as the service line for my first volley 
take one or two steps forward for the second volley, which I hope will be a winner. Once you're on your way to the net, you should try to get there as quickly as possible. There must be determination in your steps to at least get to the service line for that first volley. While you're on your way up, keep your racket in front of you so that when you meet the ball, you move right on through it rather than stopping. Some teaching professionals advise stopping. I personally do not like to stop. I think if you move straight through the ball, you get much better results. Normally, I wouldn't even think about hitting an approach shot unless the ball landed short. That is, inside the service court. But when it does and I decide to do it, I would move toward the ball deliberately with my racket at my side, not in front. And when I got to the ball, I would not stop. I'd move my body and my racket in the same direction through the ball with underspin. Now we come to the true test of your volley, because match conditions are seldom ideal as they are in practice. But notice how the basics of volley execution are the same, no matter what. The high backhand volley is one of the most difficult shots in the game, but this is what I do to try to make it easier. First, I hold the racket a bit more tightly than I do for the forehand volley. Why? Because the grip is naturally weaker. Secondly, I want the sensation that the ball is going to stay on the strings as long as possible. And I do this by keeping my wrist ahead of my racket face as I move my arm and the racket through the ball. And thirdly, and this is very important, don't flip the racket head like this through the ball. This wrist flip coupled with a weak grip will tend to make the ball go down, and that's not what you want. The high forehand volley looks like one of the easiest shots in tennis, but I certainly made more than my share of mistakes on this shot that cost me some crucial matches. The mistake is in bringing the racket across and downward rather than out and forward. And that coupled with a flippy wrist action tends to produce quite a few errors. The body is perhaps more contorted on the low forehand volley than on any other shot, but my approach is still the same, to keep my wrist in front and below the racket face. But the one concession I make to this defensive shot is to open the racket face so that the ball tends to rise as it leaves the strings. What is most important to me is that the ball go over the net on this shot. Players find themselves in reflex volley positions where they don't have enough time to hit a proper forehand volley or a proper backhand volley. You may choose one or the other. However, I choose a backhand volley and I make sure that I keep the racket well out in front. Why do I choose the backhand volley? Well, I can cover the backhand volley, the middle of body position, as well as the forehand body position. See? The half volley is one of the most offensive shots in the sport, and it is hit as soon as the ball leaves the ground. And it can be hit on any part of the court, however, the majority of them are hit at or near the service line. I fully realize when I have to hit a half volley that I'm in trouble, so I've used half a backswing to improve my timing and a very firm grip. The reason I want a firm grip is because the racket face has to act like a backboard. The natural feeling when the ball is this low to the ground is to lift it over the net and use an open racket face, when in actuality you should do exactly the opposite. I actually hood or close the racket face so that the ball won't pop up in the air when it hits the strings. I always keep in the back of my mind when executing a half volley that I want the ball to clear the net by at least a foot. If I have a choice, I'll choose to hit the forehand or the backhand half volley at my side. But in match situations, I really don't have a choice, and neither will you. However, once you've committed yourself to hitting a half volley, move on up to the net and put away the next volley. The epitome of touch at the net is the drop volley. It's a risky shot, 
especially when attempted off a hard hit ball. But when you make it, you feel like you're king for a day, or at least for the moment. Here's how I do it. First of all, with the forehand and the backhand drop volley, I wouldn't even attempt this shot unless I were close enough to feel reasonably sure that I could get it over the net. On the forehand volley, I literally want to let the ball hit the strings with enough force just to get back over the net. And I want the racket to come out of my hand a little bit, but I hold on to it with my thumb and first two fingers. On the backhand drop volley, the grip itself is naturally weaker than that for the forehand drop volley, so the racket does not have to come out of my hand quite as much. On this particular drop volley, the ball is going down the line, but you might consider hitting it cross court because the net is lower in the middle. This is one of the prettiest shots in the game when hit very effectively, one that makes the crowds go, wow. I'd have to call a cab to get that shot. But that's the beauty of getting in on top of the net. If you're the aggressor, you can end the point quickly. By the way, if you're on top of the net, a down hit is not catastrophic. You don't hit that net. So get in as close as you can. If you're about 10 feet back, you only have a 30 degree angle. But if you're right on top of the net, 130 degree angle. Three quick tips on the volley. Number one, always keep that racket head going out across the tabletop. Across the tabletop, not down at their feet. Hit towards their chest. Number two, don't hit down, but how do you keep from hitting down? You run through the volley the way the great pros like Arthur Ashe and Stan Smith do it. But some of the people like to stop, but that forces the racket down. And number three, don't be afraid to trust your instincts. If you think the ball is going to your forehand, take off. Let's say you go the wrong way. You're still going to be right 50% of the time. Don't be afraid, just go for it. Now, here's what happens to a lot of people. They don't trust their instincts. They say, is it going to my forehand or to my backhand? It was to my backhand. Three things to watch on Arthur's volley. Watch how he runs through the volley, how far out in front he hits the ball, and the racket continues across the tabletop. It doesn't go high to low, down by his feet. Now, let's look at it again and watch what happens to the one grip game and how it forces the wrist out in front. So if you have a strong wrist, use the one grip game, but take a look at this. He hits it, but look at the wrist. Now, if it feels good to you and your wrists are strong, as Arthur says, go for the one grip game if you like it. But if your wrists aren't strong and it doesn't feel good to you, then simply use two grips. The ball doesn't understand what grip you're holding. It only knows how the racket face meets it in four one thousandths of a second. Nobody had a better half volley than Arthur Ashe. And here you see Arthur on his way into the net in stop frame. So you're gonna get a real good look at his great half volley. Now watch how he gets down and you'll see the racket face is vertical or slightly pointed towards the ground at the impact point. See, it's not open face, but look at Arthur. He's running through the ball. He doesn't stop. And by the way, watch his head. It's very still as he watches what's going on in front of him. That will keep the racket steady and he continues on the way to the net. Let's take a look at it again and watch his continuous movement through the ball and up. Boy, that's sweet. And one final look at a super half volley. You know, it's easier to practice your volley than you think, as long as you choose a friend who wants to practice with you. Now, when you're out there practicing, have your friend hit you all kinds of volleys, because in a match, you're going to get all kinds. Have them hit hard straight balls, underspin, topspin, softballs, because you're going to have to get down really low on some soft volleys. So you're going to have to practice those kinds of shots in a match. Now, what happens in a match? They move you all over the court at midcourt, every kind of shot. So practice. You can't take a ball at midcourt and say to your opponent, hey, look, pass, play two. I don't take anything below my knees. Don't forget, the volley is a very important shot in doubles. And many of us who are better known as singles players also enjoy playing a lot of doubles. So develop your volley, and you'll be better for it in singles and in doubles. See you at the net. Stan's overhead is probably his most intimidating shot. If you put up a short lob to him in a match, it was lights out. 
He covered deep lobs well for a big guy, and he had great reach, so he could knock away even a good lob, and he always smashed with such authority. We didn't call him Godzilla for nothing. If you're going to come to the net, and in my opinion, that's half the fun of the game, you're going to need a good overhead. It's a backup for those good serves, approach shots, and volleys. If you can hit an overhead, it tends to neutralize those good shots. If you can hit an overhead, you'll find you'll terminate a lot of points in your favor. And I do mean terminate. More than any other stroke, the overhead is a confidence shot. But it's really not as difficult as it might look. So let's start building confidence in the overhead by learning and practicing the stroke correctly. Most good players use a continental grip on their volley. I like to hold a grip a little more towards the eastern backhand grip. With this grip, I'm ready for any volley or that surprise lob. As soon as I see a lob, I start turning sideways and move away from the net. I want to be in a position so the ball will be falling right in front of me. Late or lazy preparation is a main cause of problems on the shot. I take small shuffling or skipping steps as I move back to cover the lob. This enables me to line up the shot with precision. It's better to move too far back than not far enough. You can always adjust with a quick step forward at the last moment. I like to use my free hand as a radar gun to track the ball as it's coming over the net. This free hand also helps me to get better rotation in my shoulders so I can get more power into the shot. I also get better balance because both the free hand and the racket arm are working together instead of against each other. Some players like to lay the racket right on their shoulders as soon as they see the lob go up. I think this is somewhat awkward. Now, it may be effective for those players, but I like to take the racket back gradually because it helps my timing and rhythm. The position of the racket is very similar to that of the serve, only the windup is much more simplified. Now as the ball drops, I'm ready to go up to meet it in the same way and at the same spot I would hit the ball on the service toss. I think of hitting up on the ball to encourage a full forward stroke. A player who thinks of hitting down on the ball, as many club players do, wind up hitting the ball down in the net in most cases. So hit up to get it down and deep in the court. I make sure I don't duck my head or look too soon to the other side of the court to see where the ball is going. If I do this, which is a very common error, I'll hit the ball into the net. <laughs> now one way to make sure you finish your swing is to keep your chin up for a split second longer. By doing this, you'll find you'll have much more consistency on that big smash. I use my front shoulder to direct my overheads. The natural direction of the shot, as with my slice serve, is into my opponent's deuce court. If I want to direct it to his ad court, into the backhand, I angle my body in that direction with my front shoulder looking at the target I'm trying to hit. When you start practicing your overhead, make sure the target is the intersection of the center line and the service line. Once you've learned to hit that T consistently, you can start aiming deeper into the court.
there is some weight transfer to the front foot on the overhead, but not nearly as much as on the serve where that back foot comes forward and towards your target as you finish a shot. Remember, on the overhead, there's a tendency to overpower or muscle the ball. All you have to do, because you're so close to the net, is just have a nice smooth swing and solid contact to get the job done. First, on the serve, you can control the position of the ball with a toss. On the overhead, where the ball goes is controlled by the opponent, by gravity, and sometimes by the wind. So you need quick footwork and anticipation to be where you belong in order to hit the shot. Second on the serve, the windup is a combination of the ball toss, arm swing, and weight transfer. On the overhead, there's no toss, and with both the ball moving and you moving, an abbreviated backswing makes it much easier to time the shot. Finally, on the serve, there's a distinct weight transfer in the direction of the shot. That's also desirable on the overhead, but the follow-through is not as extensive. I've seen many fine servers who don't necessarily have good smashes, and vice versa. So even if you have a good serve, remember the overhead is a stroke that has to be learned and practiced on its own. The job of hitting an overhead gets complicated when you play somebody that really knows how to lob. So let's look at some situations where you may have to adapt your basic overhead technique to match play. There are many times when you should let the lob bounce before attacking it. A very high lob will drop practically straight down, making it hard to judge and hard to time. There's no percentage in risking a miss hit. Wait for it to land and hit it on the first bounce instead. If it's coming from too high to hit in the air, it will bounce high enough to handle with your normal stroke. Take lots of little steps and stay on your toes as you gauge the bounce of the ball. Two other times I allow the lob to bounce are when the sun is in my eyes or the wind is blowing. These factors affect confidence, and it's wiser to let the ball bounce, buy some time, and hit the overhead correctly. The top spin lob is a very difficult shot to smash because it's spinning so rapidly and it's coming to you at such a steep angle. Even the pros miss hit the shot and embarrass themselves. For this one, I really concentrated on getting my racket back quickly and shorten the backswing to meet the ball in the center of the racket. Don't get too apprehensive about this shot. Make sure you watch the ball very carefully as it descends. Over the years, I've had a tendency to take too big a swing and to hit it too hard. I've learned to take a controlled swing and not go for a sensational winner, but accurate placement. You're in good position at the net, ready for a volley. But oops, a high lob, you can't hit an overhead, you gotta get back. Hit a high lob back to your opponent, get back in position for the next shot. The most spectacular shot in tennis is the overhead hit at full stretch. When a player has leaped into the air with an athletic scissors kick. I use it when it's too late to get back in time to hit the ball any other way. I recommend that you practice this shot in stages, starting with smaller jumps until you're comfortable with a strenuous motion and can perform it safely and effectively. Whenever you get a lob, you want to try to hit it with an overhead, even if it's on the left-hand side. But occasionally you won't be quick enough and you'll have to hit the ball with a high backhand smash. Now the key to this shot is to get your arm up nice and high and get your weight back far enough so you can transfer your weight into the shot as you hit it. The key to the shot for me, and my mother will agree because she always said it was her favorite shot to watch, is to get sideways, move back quickly, so you don't get too much wrist into the stroke.
Vic has some great ideas for helping you build an effective overhead smash. You know, there are two key points which I feel most people overlook on the overhead smash. The first one is, when a ball is dropping and you're ready to smash it, if you try to take a dropping ball and hit it down, it goes right into the net, unless you're standing right on top of the net. What you have to do with the dropping ball is hit up on the dropping ball, about eight degrees up. So the next time you're hitting the overhead smash, when that ball is dropping, hit up at the ball. Don't hit it down. And the second key point Stan Smith has talked about, track the ball. But sometimes people say to me, you know, I'm having trouble tracking the ball. Watch this, this may be your problem. If you're trying to track the ball before you coil the body, it becomes very difficult. Think, coil the body, and then track the ball, and now you get a nice, smooth look. Coil, then track. Don't track, and try to coil. Watch Stan on the overhead. He coils his body first. Now the finger points towards the ball, and he steps into the ball, keeps his head upright. Watch it again. Notice he coils first. That'll give him body power. Now the finger tracks the ball. And again, watch his head. He tries to keep it very still as he tracks the ball into the racket. Bingo. Let's take another look now, watching the ball come in from a different perspective. Stan's body is turning. Stan's body is coiled. Here comes the ball. Tracks it with his finger. Remember, he's coiled first. Now the finger. Now watch the racket face snap through the ball. Now let's take a look at it again and notice that when he's striking the ball, it's forearm twisting, not wrist snapping. Watch how the forearm twist. Tracking the ball with the finger, Stan's head stays very still. The racket now starts whipping to the right of his head, the same as in a serve. Notice how the racket sits on edge like a knife. Now it turns inside out, hits the back side of the ball, and then twists in the opposite direction. Let's see it one more time. The ball is coming in. Stan has twisted his body, tracking with his finger. The racket goes left to right, turns inside out. Just like the serve in many respects. Ah! 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 You know, the overhead is really difficult for a lot of people to hit, but there's a reason. It's not you, honestly. Your eyes have difficulty. When a ball's dropping out of the sky, it's hard to gauge the distance and the timing. When the ball's on the ground, you have the fence. Now it's easier to judge where the ball is. So don't think that it's you. The only way you're going to learn to have a great overhead is to practice. Ah, practice. Ah, and practice. There's nothing more satisfying in tennis than finishing off the point with an overhead. So put in the time it takes to perfect the smash and you'll see what I mean. You wouldn't expect a great serve and volley player like Arthur Ashe to hit the lob so well. But through practice and hard work, he has developed a very effective lob. His fluid technique disguises a stroke. His quickness and preparation gets him an ideal position to hit the lob. In this position, he can also go for the shot you would more likely expect if you were rushing net on him, the passing shot. When opponents crowd the net, Arthur's lob can really catch them off guard. A lob is just a ground stroke that happens to go three or four stories high. It's hit just like a ground stroke, only the racket face is more open at impact, causing the ball to go on a high trajectory over the head of your opponent at the net. A nice, long, full swing is needed to get the ball to go not only 60 to 70 feet down court, but 40 to 50 feet up in the air as well. That way, your opponent has very little chance to attack the ball. Let's see how it's done.
Many professional players today change grips for their forehands and backhands, and many club players do as well. Even though I started out like this, I wound up with one grip on both sides. But no matter whether you change grips or use just one grip, it's important to grip the handle tighter to lessen the chance of a racket wobbling in your hands. If I have the time, I also try to plant my back foot and push off while I'm executing this stroke. The backswing on the lob depends upon whether or not you're trying to disguise it. If I'm trying to fool my opponent, I'll try to use a normal backswing, that is the same backswing that I use for a forehand or a backhand. But if I'm in trouble, I'll need to get the racket head back at the end of the backswing position as soon as the ball hits the ground on my side of the net. But either way, since the ball must go up into the air at least 20 feet, it's necessary for the racket head to get well below the ball before contact. Quite a few club players pop the ball up into the air on the lob because they abort the follow through after they feel the ball leave the strings. Ideally, when I try a lob, I want to create the sensation that the ball is going to be on the strings as long as possible. The ideal path for my swing is up and forward, and I try to remember to make contact in front of my body, just as I would for a ground stroke. When I try the backhand lob, in addition to hitting the ball out in front, I also try to remember to hold the racket firmer because the grip itself is weaker and I need to hit it higher in the air to compensate for this weakness. The next time you watch a professional match on television, notice how the players take a very elongated follow through on their lobs. A long, smooth follow through does more than just make sure that there is enough height on the ball. Direction itself is partially a function of how long the ball stays on the strings. So your chances of getting the ball to go where you aim it is partially dependent upon a long, smooth follow through. That's what the lob looks like up close. And the same basic stroke can be used to produce an offensive or defensive lob. There are several situations during a match when I just know I'm in deep trouble. When I find myself way behind the baseline, when I'm pulled far off court, or when a lob has been hit over my head and I have to run back for it. These situations call for a defensive lob that buys time for me to get back into the point. And the higher the defensive lob, the more time I buy. And where is the target area for this defensive lob? Generally, I think of hitting it cross court because the area into which I can hit it is much bigger than down the line. Let's try some. That wasn't too bad. Whereas the defensive lob, which you have just seen, is used to force your opponent away from the net and is hit very high to buy time, I use the offensive lob when I'm in better court position and I have some options. Let's take a look at the offensive lob. That was an effective lob because I hit it over my opponent's head very quickly even though I hit it with underspin. All offensive lobs share two things in common. Their trajectory is lower and they are most effective when well disguised. Even though that last lob was hit with underspin, it's the topspin offensive lobs that draws the oohs and the ahs from the tennis crowds and television commentators. The topspin offensive lob requires immaculate timing, and I wouldn't normally even think about trying it unless I knew the ball was going to wind up between my waist and my shoulder. 
and I wouldn't even try it too often on the backhand side. But on the forehand side, I had to remember to tell myself to get the racket head well below the ball so I would be able to brush up sharply to produce the topspin. Since the topspin itself causes the ball to drop faster, my thought always is to get the ball up into the air as quickly as possible. In addition, I want to avoid being too wristy with the shot, which will cause a problem for my timing. Now let's go to Vic for some ways to improve your lob. A lot of people go out and watch Arthur and Stan hit those great drives, but what they forget is Arthur and Stan also have a great lob. When you're out there practicing your lob, remember you want to get depth. Most people have the problem when they practice or when they're playing matches of hitting too short or too deep. Think that too deep is good. Don't think that depth is bad. If you're going 10 feet over the baseline, all you have to do is say, that is a super lob. Now, instead of hitting this angle, try to hit up a little bit more steeply. Guess what? That ball is going to start coming inside the baseline. So go 10 feet over, work your way in. But if you're in a match and you're hitting really short lobs, that person's going to stand there, crack the overhead, and you're going to get the fuzz sandwich. You have to practice, practice lobs. Here Arthur goes for underspin. Watch how the racket turns slightly up, hits the ball up in the air, surprises his opponent who's at the net. His opponent lunges forward, but the lob goes over his head. Let's take another look at it, but this time we're going to go very, very slowly. You'll see how Arthur looks as though he's going to drive the ball, steps in, his opponent's now charging the net, Arthur bevels the racket a little bit, catches the back, bottom side of the ball. Notice how Arthur is concentrating on the shot. Ball goes up, super. Now let's take a look at a topspin lob. The topspin lob can be hit very hard. You gotta get the racket low and then go right up to the sky with the shot. Now you get a chance to see it very, very slowly. Watch how the racket drops down low. Arthur looks as though he's gonna drive, but he puts the racket to a near vertical position and raises right up to the sky. That imparts a lot of spin on the ball. When you hit it this way, you can hit it hard, the ball goes up, forms a rainbow, and comes down quickly. You know, you gotta practice that lob over and over again. Now remember, a lob is the same as a good forehand, except you turn the racket slightly under the ball as you're raising the racket to the sky. But you have gotta practice to find out just how much bevel you need on that racket face. So when you're out there, practice hitting long, maybe 10 feet long. But the next time you hit it, Hit the same speed, but just elevate your shot a little bit more, and it'll probably drop in there. That's all Arthur's doing. He's playing scientist out there right now, checking it out so he's ready for match play. If you could hit a topspin lob like Arthur, you're probably already being invited to major events. The secret tip for a good lob is use a ball in the second hand. Make the hitting hand go to the ball in the second hand. Now, let's say you hold your hand here, you swing for your lob this way. The ball falls too short, it's too low. Just raise the ball, practice making the hitting hand go up a little bit higher. Once you find the right angle, keep it. Remember to conceal your lob. You gotta look like you're gonna drive the ball. Look what a great baseball pitcher does. They turn, they want you to think they're gonna throw a fastball, they throw a little change up, and you swing early. Same thing with Arthur and Stan. They look like they're gonna drive the ball. They lean in like this, the opponent comes in on top of the net, they probably have their nose in the net, and then Stan and Arthur go, gotcha. That completes our section on stroke production. I really think it'll help you if you go back and study those strokes you need to work on. To be a complete player, you've got to be able to hit all of them, including the lob. And if you do, the sky's the limit. Doubles is a lot of fun and a great test of your overall tennis skills. Over the years, I've also enjoyed playing doubles for the chance to work on those shots I need to win in singles, like the volley, overhead, and the lob. The doubles game calls for special tactics and good teamwork. Here's some tips to help you and your partner win more matches. When you walk to the line to serve in doubles, you want to get that first serve in. The goal is to get seven out of 10 first serves in the box. So 
relax. Don't rush it. Stop, partner. Watch where Arthur's standing when he's playing the net. He's in the center of the service box. But as you notice, when Arthur does get into the alley to make the shot, see how quickly he comes back into the center of the court. Don't just think because you've hit one, you can stand there and watch it. When Stan comes in, notice how he has to get down low for that volley. And he tries to shorten the volley punch. Don't take a long swing on that volley. Arthur comes in, he gets down low for the volley. But remember, Arthur had to really pay his dues. He had to practice getting down. He had a tendency to stay up. So he had to work hard on this shot. You know, a lot of people are a little afraid when they get the first serve in to come on into the net behind that serve. Do you have to do it? Nah. Stan demonstrates how you can serve, stay back, wait for a short ball, hit it, then come on into the net. Maybe it's a lot easier for you to do it that way. You know, this is a common myth in doubles. Whoever has the forehand takes the ball down the middle for the volley. That's not always true. If your partner's been pulled way over to a sideline, you may have to hit the backhand volley down the middle. So don't fall for that trap. Be ready to hit forehands or backhands down the middle. And by the way, always know who's going to take the ball down the middle. You work that out before you play the match. Stan Smith was a great anticipator. He always watched very carefully to see if his opponent was going to drive or lob the ball. Now, if you think they're going to lob the ball and you've looked for that little signal and up it comes, then you start moving back quickly. He can go all the way back to the baseline with ease if he anticipates properly. If you're going to be a big help to your partner in doubles, you don't want to be afraid to poach. If you think your opponent's going to hit a ball that you can reach at the net, go for it. In my opinion, the great volleyers at the net are the people who said, I'll get anything I can get my racket on from net post to net post. Now, if you miss the shot and you have a good partner, the good partner will never yell at you because they know that you made the right play. And keep this in mind, even if you miss the shot, you've let that opponent know that you're not afraid to go. When you're a good doubles team, you have to really work together. For example, Stan is poaching. Arthur, the server, spots it. The minute Stan's foot crosses the center stripe, Arthur's taking the other side. He's covered the weak side. You know, if you're the partner of the receiver, you're not stuck up there. You can poach. But remember, when you do go, your partner's got to watch you because if your foot crosses the center stripe and you don't get the volley and they hit behind you, your partner's got to be over there to cover for you. After you serve, get into the net right away because statistics will prove that the team that gets to the net first will control the point 95 out of 100 times. It doesn't mean you always win the point, but you control the point. You have the opportunity to win. The big argument, should I stop as I volley or should I run through the volley? Watch Arthur, he runs through the volley. That way he gets closer to the net increases his angle over 100 degrees. Now watch it again. Arthur says, run through the volley. Stan says, run through the volley. I say, run through the volley. As a matter of fact, Arthur said he's never seen a great player who stopped every time he volleyed. You know, here's a fun thing to watch. Arthur comes in, puts the ball away, and what happens, Stan turns around and says something nice to him. That's the way to play doubles. Say nice things to each other. Notice anything different about Stan at the net? Well, he's going to poach and look at his position. He's not in a low crouch. You can actually move a little faster by standing up a little straighter. Don't get too low. It'll actually slow you down. Watch the great players and you'll see just before they move, they will come to a more vertical position. Every once in a while in doubles, you will see the partner of the server standing on the same side as the server. This is called Australian Doubles. Why do they do it? Because sometimes the receiver has a favorite shot, cross court, for example, in this situation. Now, Stan stands right in front of that favorite shot, and that forces the receiver to go in a different direction. And look what happens. It confuses the receiver, Arthur comes in for an easy shot, and Bingo puts it away. Notice that while Arthur is receiving service, Stan is way up towards the net. Now, why? Because if Arthur does return a good serve, 
at the feet of the onrushing server. That person is apt to raise the ball. Well, if they do raise it up, Stan will be there to hit down. The name of the game, if you're the receiver, is to try to get the net away from the serving team. And that happens sometimes when the servers don't take the net and you hit a good service return, just get in there. Well, you saw Stan take the net away from his opponent on that service return. Now watch how Arthur takes the net away from his opponent. You can take a lobbing situation and turn it into a great offensive play. Every time you lob over your opponent's head and they have to run back for the shot, you should be moving forward. Match them step for step. So when they turn around to hit the shot, you're already there. The tactics of serving vary according to what you can do with your serve and the strengths and weaknesses of your opponents. In theory, you're in control of a point when you're serving, so that's an advantage. But you have to be in control of your serve for that theory to work in a match. The key to control is spin, as I'll demonstrate. Let's go to the baseline. When I'm serving to the deuce court, I try to put myself within a yard of this center mark on the baseline because I want to be at the shortest possible distance between myself and my target area in the service court. And besides, I also want to be in the middle of that angle from my opponent so that I can get to forehands and backhands rather easily. Now in the ad court, I'm a bit farther away from the center mark because I want to serve over a lower part of the net, yet still keep myself in the middle of that angle from my opponent for forehands and backhands. Now, for doubles, I move even farther away from that center mark. Why? Because the court is nine feet wider, and I've got to cover my half of the court. And besides, I don't want to hit my partner in the kidneys. Now that we know how to stand, let's look at the differences between the first serve and the second serve. It's very important to know when you can afford to take a big chance on a first serve. I like to take a chance when I'm feeling confident, when I'm ahead in a match, and if I'm up by at least two points in a game. And when I do go for that big first serve, I like to follow it to the net. Let's see how that works. You see, that good first serve put me in position to win the point. Now let's look at a second serve. The last thing you want to do in a second serve is double fault. To avoid that, you want to hit the second serve with more spin and at a slower speed than you would for your first serve. Remember, the harder you hit the ball, the more likely you are to make a mistake. The majority of players develop a safe spin serve to their opponent's backhand. Well, now you might ask about depth. Well, I think it would take years of practice to develop consistency to within a foot or so of the service line. So I recommend you try three feet from the service line with a lot of spin, and you'll be amazed at how effective that can be. Well, that spin certainly helped. But there's another important reason for developing spin on both the first and second serves. It gives you tremendous control and allows you to hit the ball to specific target areas in the service court. The ability to serve with speed and control opens up a whole new world for the server. Now you can move your opponent around and probe his or her weaknesses. For instance, suppose my opponent has a weak backhand. I can spin it down the middle and crowd it. Ooh, that felt pretty good. But now to keep him honest, I'm going to swing him wide to the forehand to open up the backhand side of the court. When I serve to a left-handed player in the deuce court, I tend to serve down the middle of the court itself into the left-hand side, his backhand side. That worked well because I pulled him completely out of court. Now let's look at some serving tactics for the ad court. 
When I'm serving to the ad court, I'm fully aware that more of the high portion of the net faces me than when I'm serving to the deuce court. So I usually try to put more spin on my serve from this side to make sure it clears the net. My bread and butter serve here is a kicking spin serve to my opponent's backhand. Let's try it. That kicking serve forced a high return from my opponent and I put the volley away for a winner. Now I'm going to try a spin serve down the middle. That spin serve down the middle forced my opponent to hit his return back down the middle and I was able to attack that volley. Serving tactics like these should help you as well. Here are some things I try to keep in mind when I'm serving, and these tips may help you as well. First, I try to be as relaxed as possible. I don't want to be tense when I begin my serve. Secondly, I try to take a couple of deep breaths, again, to relax me and relieve some tension. Thirdly, on a ball toss, if I don't like it, I can catch it. There's nothing in the rule book that says you must hit a bad toss. Fourthly, after serving, I jump back quickly because when I finish my serve, I'm inside the baseline and I want to be behind the baseline for the next shot. And fifth, I don't want to rush between my first and second serve. In fact, I try to allow about three seconds between serves. There are many different ways to serve, but the last thing you want to do is be thinking of all that when the time comes to put the ball in play. Know exactly where you want to hit the ball each time you serve, and never change your mind in the middle of your backswing. A serve is like the opening move in chess. It gives you a chance to control play and put some pressure on your opponent. Make the most of it. It seems like only the pros practice the return of serve, which may explain why they are the pros. It really is a much neglected shot. If you can become consistent with that return of serve, you're going to be hard to beat. Here's how to do it. Where should you stand to return serve? Well, it really varies according to your opponent's ability and his positioning. Basically, you want to stand in the center of his capabilities so you can get the ball to the backhand or the forehand equally as well. Now, in the deuce court, I stand pretty close to the sideline so I can cover either shot just as well. In doubles, I'll stand a little further over here to the sideline so I can cover that wide ball to the forehand. Now, if I'm having trouble returning that first serve, I'll stand five or six feet back behind the baseline and over to the side so I can cover that wide ball and just try to get the ball back in play. If my opponent has missed his first serve, I'll stand inside the baseline a couple steps and then certainly the ball will come weaker than it would on the first serve and I'll really put pressure on him and make him think about what I'm going to do on the return to serve. Now let's look at the backhand side. In the ad court, the same rules for positioning apply. Only the angles are a little bit different. You don't stand as far over against a right-hander in the ad court to return serve. He can't hurt you with that slice serve on this side. But a left-hander can really hurt you with that slice serve, and you may want to stand over here in the alley to get that ball back. Remember, the most important thing is to get the ball back consistently. Once you do that, you can work on your accuracy. Now let's prepare to return some serves. It's a matter of personal choice, but I decided it's better to wait for the serve holding the racket with my backhand grip. I used to wait with a forehand grip because it was easier for me to change from the forehand to the backhand than from the backhand to the forehand. But then I realized about 80% of the serves were coming to my backhand side, and it made more sense for me to start with a backhand grip to return serve. I don't hold the grip too tightly. In fact, I hold it loosely and I'll spin it and I'll breathe deeply a couple times to make sure I'm nice and relaxed. My feet are about shoulder width apart, my knees slightly bent. I don't bend over like this because you can't move very efficiently from here. On the other hand, I don't stand up casually like this because you can't move quickly from here either. I have my racket out in front of me. I support the throat with my left hand. This way I can go to the right or the left just as easily. I want you to some serves at me. To improve my concentration, I try to watch the ball all the way from the toss. 
I take a little hop with both feet. Most of the pros do this. It gets them primed for action. On those hard first serves, you can't take a big swing. I try to start my racket back as soon as I see the ball leave my opponent's racket. On the ground strokes, I take my racket all the way back to the fence. But on those fast ones, I take a short back swing and try to just chip or block the ball back. Now let's see the regular ground strokes backswing in slow motion. Compared to the short backswing or the service return. I watch the ball intently on the serve to determine the spin because that will tell me how the ball is going to bounce. I try to meet the ball in front of me and on the rise. If I get a forehand, I'll try to hit the ball with a little bit of topspin. If I get a backhand, I usually return flat or with a little slice. On a second serve, I might stand in a couple steps and over to the center to make sure I get a forehand. Or, I might start in this neutral position, and as he tosses the ball up, move towards the center and hit that forehand. As you can see, when I move over to hit that forehand, it puts me in good position in the center of the court. Now the third thing I can do is I can take that weak second serve and come into the net behind the return. It's hard to stress enough the importance of the return of serve. If you never missed a return to serve, you'd probably never lose a match. I'm better known as a serve and volley player, but on slow surfaces, I had to pay my dues at the baseline like everyone else. We all need to be able to play from the backcourt some of the time. In fact, the great serve and volley players knew how to win from the backcourt as well as up at net. So let's take a look at some of the tactical principles that govern play in a baseline rally. Before I even start, I want to make sure I get my serve in nice and deep. Then, I want to hit the ball five times to give my opponent a chance to make an error before I do. And I do that partly by making sure the ball goes at least five feet over the net to give myself plenty of margin. And also while I'm scrambling around, once the ball leaves my racket, I jump back into the ready position. And I'm also not out here just hitting the ball aimlessly. I've got a plan in mind. I happen to know that my opponent has a weak backhand, so I'm gonna to try to exploit that now. There, that worked. But sometimes it's not always possible to exploit an opponent's backhand directly. Sometimes I've got to go to his backhand through his forehand. Sometimes it's impossible to go directly to your opponent's backhand because it just gets better. You've got to go exploit his backhand by going to his forehand first. There, that worked well also. But frequently my opponent moves from side to side very well. That is, he's very good at lateral movement, but not so good at coming up and back. So I may want to try a drop shot to bring him to the net, then try to pass him. There are a lot of reasons for wanting to possibly hit a drop shot. One is that your opponent just may not want to come to the net. He may be afraid of it. Then two, you may want to tire him out for later on in the match. It may not work in the beginning, but along about the third set, when you're both tired, all those drop shots will start to pay off. Sometimes it works. But what if your opponent starts to rush the net on you? Well, as a baseliner, you are not necessarily at a disadvantage. But you do have to adjust your strategy to this new threat at the net by counterattacking.
I try to chip the ball back deep against someone who hits the ball very hard to keep him pinned behind the baseline. And if I happen to hit a short ball and see him coming to the net, I may chip it at his feet to try to get a short ball and hit a passing shot. Well, that should work most of the time. But a final option is the lob, one of the most underutilized of counterattack weapons. With this other option, I get into a long point against my opponent. If he happens to come to the net, what I can do is lob it over his head, making sure there's plenty of height. And I just might get away with it. Players like Bjorn Borg, Chris Everett Lord, and many other champions have proven just how effective a baseline game can be. Master your stroke production, use your tactical skills wisely, and it will be a winning game for you too. A short ball is any ball that lands in the service court or just beyond the service line. In this area, the ball is vulnerable to attack. Let's analyze some of the smart ways to take advantage of short balls. One of the most favorite of short ball tactics is a put away. In this particular instance, you're trying to win the point outright from a short ball, but you've got to wait until you get the right opportunity and not force it because you might make a mistake. But when you do, chances are you want to go cross court for two reasons. The net's lower and you've got more court to play with. Now you might also try it down the line. And that's a bit riskier, but sometimes it works. Again, you've got to wait for the right opportunity and be patient. But It sometimes works, but then again it's fraught with danger for two reasons. One, the net's higher, and two, the target area is smaller. Another short ball tactic is a drop shot. The first thing I learned about drop shots is that you never try it from behind the baseline because it's too risky. You always try it from an area between the baseline and the service line. You're much better off. Your margin of safety is much higher. And secondly, you've got to decide whether or not you want to hit the drop shot cross court or down the line. The same considerations you use for the put away. I prefer to go cross court. The net's lower. Thirdly, a further consideration is no matter how effective your drop shot is, expect your opponent to get to it. And lastly, a cardinal rule along with not trying one from the baseline, always get the ball over the net. Because even a well-executed drop shot that doesn't get over loses the point for you. Another short ball tactic is the approach shot, which is used to get to the net during a baseline rally. And on the forehand, I can actually hit this shot with underspin, topspin, or flat. But I usually choose underspin because it's safer. And the harder I hit the ball, the more likely I am to make a mistake. And placement is much more important than power, so I want to be safe with it. And when I do hit this approach shot, 80% of the time I go down the line because I can place myself to one side of the center service line and force my opponent to hit the ball directly back to me or to the far side of the court which is at very high risk to him. Now let's look at two approaches from the backhand side, down the middle and surprisingly short and cross court. You may not realize it when you're watching the pros play on television, but quite a few of them elect to hit their backhand approach shots with the underspin, but down the middle. Underspin because the ball is not gonna bounce very high, and down the middle because they can place themselves 
in the middle of the court and try to hit that one big volley. Another backhand approach tactic is to hit the ball short and cross court. More often than not, you'll see the pros try this on a clay court rather than a cement court or indoors. And they'll be using underspin because that's a natural shot from the backhand side. And the ball is not going to rise very much when it hits the ground. The object of this approach shot is to hit the ball cross court, pull your opponent way out of court, and you'll be able to win with one volley. When approach shots like those work well, it makes you feel pretty good. If the volley were the first stroke that people learn instead of the last, as in most cases, more people would feel comfortable and sure themselves up at the net. As it is, this area seems like a strange foreign country to many players. They feel threatened, uncomfortable, and nervous. I like to do something about that because I sincerely believe that with the right shots and tactics, anyone can play the net effectively and enjoy it at the same time. The two most common ways to get to the net are following the serve and following the approach shot. The basic idea is the same, only the tactical situation is a little bit different. When I serve and volley, I know before I serve that I'm going to rush net. I plan in my mind where I'm going to serve it and that tells me how I'm going to follow it in. When I serve wide to my opponent's forehand on the deuce court, I want to follow that serve, shading just left of center so I can cover any return that he might hit to me. Now that's one tactic, serving wide to the forehand. The other one is serving right down the middle to your opponent's backhand. And hitting that serve, you want to come in right behind your serve, right down the center, so you're right in the center of the court, ready to hit either volley. Now let's see that serve and volley in slow motion. In both cases, I try to reach the service line to hit that first volley. After three quick running steps, I make a split step as my opponent hits the ball to set myself up in a balanced position to move for that first volley. On the approach shot, which I usually hit down the line, I try to get the ball as deep as possible. I don't hit the ball as hard as I do on my serve, so it buys me more time to get close to the net. I want to use that same split step to prepare to hit that volley inside the service line. If a second volley is necessary, it should be a put away if the point has gone my way. Now I'm looking for an attempted passing shot for my opponent. And if I hit my first volley aggressive enough, the second one should be an easy put away. Footwork is extremely important to get you in good position for that second volley. This second volley position is also an ideal time to try to hit that drop volley. If my opponent's been pulled wide or is off balance behind the baseline, I'll occasionally hit this touch shot to win the point outright. You never know when someone will get to even one of your best efforts. But the ultimate stopper in net tactics is the overhead. The opponent may try to lob you at any time when you come into the net. And you have to be able to answer that lob with a reliable smash. If you've got the ultimate stopper and a good volley, your opponent won't want to lob you or try to pass you. And you should be making your home right here at the net. You know, everybody wants to play better tennis, but you have to pay your dues. You have to get out and hit with the new system over and over again. Stan Smith, Arthur Ashe, they had to do the same thing. There is no shortcut. You got to get out there and hit a lot of balls. Remember, your brain has worked on a system for a long time. That's the one you have now. But the one you have now is the reason why you have not been invited to major events. So get out there with the new system. You may feel uncomfortable at first, but just hang in there. Hit the ball over and over again. But pretty soon, the new system will start to feel comfortable. Watch the drills that Stan Smith and Arthur Ashe give you and try to follow them. But remember, be patient, and you're going to go right to Wimbledon. This is a two-on-one drill. 
The purpose of this drill is to make your opponent on the other side of the net run side to side on the court. It's simulating match play where he's trying to hit passing shots but only into the singles court. He's got to get every ball on the bound one bounce if he can. That's it. As he runs for it, it's simulating trying to hit passing shots in a singles match. He's got to try for every ball, whether it's in or out. He's got to get to every ball on the first bounce. Come on there, Annie. I'll guarantee you, after just a few minutes of this drill, he's going to be begging for mercy. Oh, good shot. Now we'll move back to the baseline. The two of us will be hitting balls to him when he's at the net so he can practice his movement with his volleys. Okay, now he comes up to the net and he's going to be playing the net like he would be in a match. He's trying to react to every shot, whether they come hard or whether they're dink shots. If he gets a little too close to the net, you can lob him to get him back far enough. As soon as he misses a ball or hits a winner, then you hit another ball immediately so it keeps him moving. He's got to reach for every ball. That's it. It's all right. Reach for every ball. Go for every shot. That's good. Good playing there. That's it. Another lob. Come back into the net quickly. Okay, that's good movement. All right, after they've done this, both of the net and the baseline, they're going to be ready to play that match. This drill is about as basic as there is in the entire sport of tennis. And what I'm trying to do, along with my practice partner, is just to keep the ball in the court without missing, but at the same time, not babying it. A variation of this drill is not to keep the, hit the ball too hard so that we can keep it going. And you're allowed to hit any shot you want, even drop shots and lobs but you can't hit it hard. And at the end, you want to have the feeling that, hey, I just can't miss. It's a great confidence booster. And it is as basic to the sport as swimming laps and swimming. This is a lateral volley drill with one man at the baseline standing either in the forehand corner or the backhand corner and at the man at the net alternating forehands and backhand volleys. It's like this. There we go. He's got to move either side to get the volley. This is a tough drill to do. He has to keep moving all the time, stretch those volleys, then recover. Sign of a great player is one that can recover quickly and get back in position for the next shot. That's good volleying. Good reach. You're there. Okay. If you do this enough times, when you get to a match, you'll really be confident up there at the net. In this next drill, we're trying to get the ball to land between the service line and the baseline. And in order to do that, I've got to hit the ball with enough pace to get it to go there. So we can't baby the ball. And we usually play up to 21. And the score right now is 1919. And I played this sport and this game a lot when I was a kid. And I usually won. Whoops, that's 2019 for me because he hit it short in the service court. As I said, when I was a kid, I played this and did very well, even against the older guys. Oh, that was out. 20 all, sudden death. Even against the older guys, I could do well if they didn't hit the ball too hard. Aha, uh -huh. I won that one, but I don't always win. This is the overhead drill. One player is at the baseline and the other is at the net. The key to this drill is he has to touch the net after each overhead that he hits. You start with some easy ones, get him used to it. And as they get used to it, hit the ball a little bit deeper. Really make a move. Now this drill looks easy, but it really is not, and it's going to be very tiring 
especially get those deep overheads. Okay, a lot of people don't practice their overhead, but if you did this drill every day, you would have a great overhead in just a couple weeks. Now let's put these strokes together and try them in combination. First, a ground stroke, an approach shot, a volley, and an overhead. And most approach shots go down the line. Make sure I don't miss the volley or the overhead. We try it again, still on the forehand side. First, the ground stroke, and this helps to approximate a real match situation. <clears throat> Not bad. One more time. And even if you miss, you keep going with the exercise. Ah, because nobody's perfect. Try some of these drills. It'll improve your conditioning, your strokes will be grooved, and besides, they're fun. Whether you're a kid growing up in a big city or a senior citizen out in a rural area, there's a place for you to learn tennis and a qualified instructor to help you get better at it. Schools, colleges, camps, public parks, tennis centers, resorts. They all offer opportunities to help you enjoy it more and to play it more effectively. So if you get a chance to take a lesson from a qualified teacher, whether in a clinic, a group lesson, or an individual lesson, I urge you to do so. Now here's Vic with some ideas about how you can get the most out of that lesson. Now you're ready for the big match, but you gotta warm up first, and the way you use that warm up time may determine the outcome of your match. Listen to what Stan Smith has to say about how to warm up. A lot of players warm up not by hitting balls, but by chasing them. They hit from the furthest distance they'll have to hit in the whole match instead of practicing the short shots. Let me show you a better way. Let's hit some. You know, in basketball, when you watch the players warm up, they start with layups. They don't start shooting from mid-court. Well, in tennis, you want to do the same thing. You want to start nice and close to your opponent in a mini-court drill. In this drill, you have your short backswing, but still a long follow-through towards your opponent. Now, this helps you develop your eye racket control. We do everything in life with just our hand, and sometimes we don't get the right position of having the racket distance away from the ball. By doing this drill, you'll get the feel of the ball and the strings and help you develop the rhythm for your strokes. You'd also get nice touch and control, which is really more important to you when you play tennis than power. When you do this drill, make sure you move your feet, don't get lazy, so your feet are in the exact same position as they would be when you're hitting the ball with the long strokes from the baseline. After hitting about 10 balls with as many tennis form, gradually move back and start hitting some forehands and some backhands from the baseline. Once you get back to the baseline, you can work on hitting forehands and backhands just like you were at the net. But this time, of course, you're hitting the ball deeper and higher over the net. After doing the drill at the net, you should have more confidence and hit the ball more solidly in the center of your racket. Now, once you get a short ball, you should take that ball and come to the net and practice your hard volleys. It's important on the volleys up here to watch the ball very carefully because you're very close to your opponent. You want to watch it hit your racket, hopefully right in the center of your racket. Keep your arms out in front of you so that you don't hit the ball behind your body, and you'll really feel a lot more comfortable when you get into the match after doing this. 
be sure to ask for some overheads. And hitting the overheads, don't want to try to hit the ball too hard, but just keep it nice and relaxed and hit the ball for placement. You've got to move your feet, get sideways and get your racket back quickly, and just go for those nice smooth shots into the corner. After you've done that, you can come back and practice your serve. The most important thing about your serve is you don't serve too hard too soon. It's key to just develop a nice smooth rhythm so you'll be able to have that rhythm when you get into a match and you'll have confidence. Make sure you serve not just one or two serves, but several serves. It's better to serve too many serves than not enough. Now once you've served several serves, you can start working on your pace and your accuracy, just like you would be in a match. Make sure you practice both your first and second serve. That second serve is really important, particularly when it gets tight in a match. The first and second serve should be warmed up, just like all the rest of your strokes. Many people think of warm-up as their last chance to get better. Well, it's a little late to improve your game at that point. The whole purpose of the warm-up is to prepare yourself for the match. If you do it our way, I think you'll get ready for that match and play to the best of your ability. Well, we've talked about the mechanics of the game and strategy. Let's get to the inner game of tennis. Arthur and Stan, I know I started playing tennis when I was caught in a theft. I was stealing <laughs> tennis balls. Now I want to know how you guys started. Well, I started on a public park because my father was a caretaker for a very large playground in Richmond, Virginia. And a house came with a job. And I lived four, about four yards away from ten tennis courts. And... Uh, and there was an Olympic-sized pool, two basketball courts, three baseball diamonds, two football fields, and a utility field. That's where I lived until I was 17. How about you, Stan? Well, I started playing when I was about 11 or 12, and I played, my mother took me up to this park, and I played there a little bit. Then some people in Pasadena formed the Pasadena Tennis Patrons, and that was the opportunity to get me some really good coaching. They hired Pancho Segura as a coach, and he's one of the great strategists of the game. And we played with him for for hours on Saturday morning at Pasadena High School. The better players would get to play with him, and then we would also teach some of the kids there. The better players of us would teach some of the young players that came out. You know, Art, sometimes you're, uh, you're considered the Jackie Robinson of tennis, and you made some big breakthroughs, and you made it sound like, you know, you kind of had an easy entry point into the game. Was it really as easy as you talk? No, it wasn't quite as easy. Of course, I think, obvious to me that Althea Gibson, who was the first black player to really crack through the sport, was a, more of a pioneer than I was. She played at Forest Hills in 1950, and I think she paved the way. And she was from the north, and she was able to withstand the, uh, the pressures of, of being the only black player out there. I had some problems solely because I was brought up in the south, and the integration days had not uh, come upon us yet. And so I literally had to leave my hometown and my home state in order to play well. And uh, in leaving, my tennis got better, but of course I didn't like the fact that I had to leave. But it was probably the best thing for my tennis. Stan, you know, there's, uh, you talk about getting started in a game, but I remember when I was in Las Vegas once, and I watched you play Gonzalez in the finals once, and it was a very windy day. And at that time, you're kind of chipping the backhand coming across, and the wind was blowing it wide. And I always, I made the comment I was on doing the TV, and I said, Jesus, Stan, I had a drop, I mean, a topspin cross-court passing shot. I think he'd really be terrific. So I go out to the L.A. Tennis Club a couple, three days later, and you're bouncing balls working on a topspin backhand. I can't remember, it's about 73 or 74, something like that. So you've always had that practice ethic? Well, Vic, I always listen to you. You know, I heard you whispering there <laughs> in the background, so uh, I decided that I had to. Uh, to work on my game. I wasn't as, 
I don't think I was as talented as some of the other players. And so in Pasadena, they really made us work. We'd have to bring a jump rope to, to class on Saturday mornings. If we were late, we'd do wind sprints. We do wind sprints anyway, we do calisthenics, and we work on drills, cross court forehands, cross court backhands, down the line backhands. We'd have a, a, a box of balls, we'd hit a, a bunch of serves. And so they instilled in me the fact that you really had to work on your game, and that kind of continued with me my whole career. You guys talk about the work ethic, and I know a lot of people who work hard, but they haven't made it. So what's the difference between a champion and a, and a person who works hard? Well, there's a certain degree of talent <laughs> that uh, you know, is required to become a champion. But I think that also some people work hard, but they have no direction with the way they work. They will go out and just hit balls randomly for six hours and say, gee, I played six hours today. But uh, I was always taught that try to, to have a purpose in every ball you hit, either a target area in the court or a type of trajectory of the ball that you should hit. And so you get a lot of, uh, a lot of out of your time that you spend on the court and not just hit balls. Same thing happened to us because when I was at the home of my tennis mentor, Dr. Walter Johnson in Lynchburg, in the summers, there was only one court, and there were about eight or ten of us. And so with one court and eight or ten players, you had to maximize the use of your time. And he also had a sign hung up in the locker room, the basement of his house, which was a correction to that adage that everybody's heard of, that practice makes perfect. His sign says, correct practice makes perfect. And I learned, as Stan mentioned, that you must work hard, but you must work hard with some sense of purpose in order to, to make uh, your tennis succeed. And it worked for me. Let's say you guys are out observing a bunch of players. There are 100 players, unbelievably talented players. They're, they're fast, quick hands, quick feet. And you've got to choose one in the afternoon to represent you. What would you look for? It's hard to say when you see them practice because a real champion has a desire to win. And he'll be a hard worker, of course, but when you get into a match situation, they have the desire to win. They're not going to be satisfied with second place. And that's hard to see on a practice court, but I like to see a person who's going to be quick, you know, who uh, seems to have some sort of discipline, and that really has the desire to win when they're on the court. I look for athletic ability overall. I think 70 to 80 percent of success in tennis is dependent upon the feet. If you cannot move, all the great strokes in the world are not going to help you. And then I look for hand-eye coordination. Does that person look as if he or she is wielding the racket with some ease? And then, as Stan mentioned, if the mental discipline and the determination is not there, well then the fast feet and the hand-eye coordination may not work because they'll get flustered and just may not be able to produce. But I first look for the feet. So you guys are now uh, mechanically in great shape, you're making the right decision, you practice all the things, but every once in a while I hear you guys talk about being in the zone. What does that mean? Well, I think that coin a phrase came from Tom Gorman and Eric Van Dillen during Davis Cup once when they liked to come up with lots of puns and plays on words. And I used it a couple times in some newspaper or magazine articles, and it was then picked up, I think, by some of the other press or media people. It means that state of or period of time in a match when a player is just acting purely on instinct. Another way we described it was hitting no-brainers, meaning that you're not thinking about it. Anything you do just turns to gold, so to speak and there's no rationale and there's no reasoning process going on. You just play, you just flow. Everything is just flowing and the shots are coming off your racket and they're hitting the corners and you're hitting your volleys crisply and you're getting your first serve in and you're moving your feet and you're having a great time and you just want to go call your best friend and tell him, hey, this is the greatest feeling I've ever had in my life. And we used to call you the king of the no-brainer, right? <laughs> well, in the zone, I think you're on automatic pilot. You know, you're not thinking about what you're doing. You're thinking a little bit about your strategy and where the ball is going to be going. But you don't worry about technique. You don't worry about, you know, the toss or your feet or anything like that. You just do it. All right, now you guys are going to play each other. Let's set the scene. You can recall, I think, those days when maybe a week before you know you're going to meet each other probably in the finals or in the event. How did you plan to play each other? It depended on the surface. And it may depend a little bit on how 
Stan had played before we met each other in the tournament. But since we were very good friends, I knew how he played. And we played each other quite a bit of times in practice and in matches. And so I knew what to expect. Sometimes it didn't matter, but I, at least I did know what to expect. And I would look for things in Stan as I would in any other opponent. I'd look for what they could least do best. And I would try to probe that area. What did he do least best? Well, he had a very good serve. He had a very good forehand. He had very good range. Backhand side, the left wing was a little dodgy. <laughs> and I'd try to get to that side through his strength. And uh, What does that mean, through his strength? That is, you, you can't go directly to a weakness. You've got to get to a weakness through some other stroke. And if you can set up the chance to go to a weakness through the strength, you'll have a pretty good uh, chance of winning the point. Well, Vic, you know, playing against Arthur was always very difficult because you never knew exactly what to expect. <laughs> when you play him, you know, he either won the match or he lost the match. I mean, you're kind of uh, an insignificant person out there on the court because, as I said before, he liked to hit these no-brainers. And so he'd go for shots. And Are you and, saying uh, I was hit or miss? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, he would determine the outcome of the match. But basically, you want to try to keep him off balance because if you got in the groove and you start hitting those shots you know, time and time again, you really had little chance. So you want to try to keep him off balance and serve a bit more to the forehand to make him hit those forehands because his backhand was deadly. Well, what are the other ways you kept him off balance? Well, I try to change the pace of the shot, not always hit the same pace all the time because uh, you'd like to be like a good baseball player with a, a fastball. You make contact with that thing and it'd be home runs all the time. So uh, I try to, you know, serve spinners, serve fast ones. Uh, make him move to the side, make him run forward to hit shots. Stan, Stan, you're ahead first. How do you handle yourself when you're ahead? Well, if you're ahead and you've, been a, uh, you've gotten ahead by hitting big first serves and not compromising the first serve and spinning the second one in, try to continue to do it through the match and, and go for those big first serves and don't get conservative. Uh, if, if you have been playing just by uh, and winning by playing steadily, then uh, don't try to get real aggressive all of a sudden and close the match out quickly, but stay steady on the court. So I think you have to stay, as Arthur said, stay with your game plan, try to continue to do what you've been doing. Don't change it too much. So do you have a contingency plan pre-planned when you're behind? Yes, it's important. Uh, as Arthur mentioned, a game plan is really important as you go on the court, because if you have a game plan, it gives you confidence. Uh, now, if you're having problems with a match, then you should have some contingency plans in the back of your mind that you can move to. But if you don't go out there with a game plan at all, you're just kind of playing helter-skelter, then you don't, know have, you don't know where to go when you start having problems. And so it's a good idea to, to have the idea, let's say I'm going to serve to the person's backhand and volley to the open corner. Uh, and if that doesn't work, I'm going to serve to the backhand and then volley behind him. And so you know two or three different things you can do if you're having problems. In this closing out phase of a match, the key thing to remember is decisiveness. You've got to be decisive with your game plan. You've got to uh, make up your mind what you're going to do and do it. You know, I'm listening to this bird chirp up there. Stan, I hear one of the funny stories from you about a bird. You, you, let's throw it out for these people. <laughs> well, in 1976, I was playing in Washington, D.C. And at that uh, facility, a lot of low-flying birds would come across the court. And so, uh, coincidentally, I don't usually say this, but I say I did on purpose, this bird was flying across the court, and right about when it got to the T of the center service line and the service line, I hit a serve about 150 miles an hour, as I normally did. The ball <laughs> hit, the, it was about to hit the court, and it hit the bird in flight and snapped its neck. Uh. Well, I figured, you know, I don't do this too often, maybe one out of 20 times, and so I decided to step over the net, pick up the bird, I gave the bird to the linesman, not exactly how some of the guys do it today. And uh, they gave it a proper burial. Oh, I... I remember court three at Wimbledon. Clark Ravenier was playing. I forget whom he was playing against. But uh, he, he hit a big serve, and he waited for a, a decision from the, center, from the service lines person. And there was no call. And then the umpire turned around and looked to get a call. And there was no call, and there was a a lady on the line, head over, fast asleep. 
<laughs> she had fallen asleep on court three at Wimbledon. All right, now we get down to the real thing. I want you to set the scene. Uh, it was a WCT event. You guys were playing in Dallas, and there was a big debate about a particular point, not between you guys, but between everybody in the stands. It was a wild point, and it was a major point, and a turning point in the match. Can you set the scene for us, Art? I think, as I recall, that I was at the net, and I hit uh, a, a drop shot or a drop volley, and Stan came running in furiously, and he hit it, he hit the lob over my head, and he eventually won the point. And there was some contention as to whether or not Stanley got it on the first bounce or not. And no one was quite sure. It's the duty of the let court judge to tell whether or not it's not up or not, whether the ball was gotten on the first bounce. And uh, after Stan won the point, the umpire wanted to ask Stan, well, he wasn't sure. Well, did you get it or didn't you? And so I just asked Stan, I said, well, did you get it? And Stan said, yeah, I got it. I said, well, if, he, if Stan says he got it, then he got it. Well, that was a great one-liner, and it stands because we don't often see that in tennis today, and that's a lot of class. You had a lot of confidence uh, in what you had to say. How did you feel when he asked you that question, Stan? Well, he puts you on the spot. Normally, the umpire has to make the call, but at that point in time, you know, uh, Arthur and I were good friends, and it was a very crucial point in the match. It was very near the end of the match, and uh, we played a, a good match, and I thought it was particularly good because I was winning, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, when I got to the ball, I, I wasn't a, you know, I wasn't 110% sure I got to it, but I thought I had gotten to it, so that's all I could say to Arthur. Well, it's a, pretty interesting that you guys are playing for big bucks and you're good friends, and at the same time, Arthur takes the call. That shows some class. Well, it, it really was uh, nice of him to accept that. I mean, I could see players today uh, not really accepting that quite as <laughs> gentlemanly as, as Arthur did, but. Uh, those are things you like to look back on and hope that, that you won matches honestly. You know, as a coach, I teach a lot of adults and a lot of kids, and I really would hope that more and more people would listen to your story and start imitating some of the approaches that you two have taken and really play it your way. You know, I've been teaching tennis for over 40 years. I've known Stan and Arthur since they were teenagers. They have contributed so much to this game. So when they talk about the game, I stand up and listen. They've done it all. But you know, I've always heard that to be a great champion, you had to be some kind of an animal. You had to have hair on your tongue and growl. But you know, these guys aren't like that at all. They're intelligent, they're fun to be with, they study the game, they have friends who have lasted for 20, 30 years. That's a beautiful thing about these particular people. So I would suggest to you that you pay your dues the same way they paid their dues. You gotta get out in the court and try things. Have some fun, be very patient, but don't take too big of a bite. Because if you try to do too many things, you're gonna overload the system. Just take one little point they've talked about. Go out and experiment with it. Maybe sit in the living room, sit on the couch, you just think it through for a while. And then go out and very patiently you try these things and experiment. But in the end, physical laws dictates what happens to a ball, what happens to your success. And Arthur and Stan have to honor these points too. But while you're doing all of these things, laugh, have some fun. I always say, laugh your guts out. Laugh and win. You're going to be famous by Friday. Good luck. Looks like the first real error from Arthur Rash. That may be effective, but I personally... You may not realize it when you see the pros playing on television, but when they're hitting their forehand underspins into the net... To improve my concentration, I try to watch the ball all the way from the top. 
this. Let's check. Three quick tips on the volley. Number one, always make that racket head and get the flies off your nose. Could you pick it up? It's a gnat, yeah. <laughs> some people, some people use the term volley when they mean. Some people use the term volley when they mean. <laughs> Come on, I can really get it. What I really mean, rally. One take. Some big and little secrets of success for tennis. Okay. Well, the Vicks help. We're going to help you. The 184 takes. You're just <laughs> on the beginning. We're only on 100. Okay.